Okay, everyone, it's Alex Ball with another episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast. On today's show, we sit down with Lindsay Steele of Garden Fort, located in Dester, Michigan. We dig deep on lean, no-till bed prep, selling to retail, and building a long-term employee-focused business. So without any further ado, let's get to the show with Lindsay from Garden Fort. Today's episode is brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process, so make sure to check them out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Orisha. Orisha is a greenhouse automation company whose mission is to make agriculture more ecological and productive through advanced technology. Orisha automates all temperature, humidity, and irrigation management systems. Their products are designed to be instinctive easy to install and wireless, and their remote management application allows growers to save time. In addition, the integration of AI in their programs offers more precision and better control over the various factors influencing the environment inside your greenhouse. Last thing, Orisha wants to help market gardeners optimize their yields. Automating allows a better quality of life, can save several weeks of labor costs, and saves nearly 20% in energy costs. Listeners can use the promo code no till grower. That's three words, no till grower, to get 15% off your order. Check them out at orisha.io. That's O R I S H A dot I O. All right. Enjoy the show. Okay, Lindsay, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. It, it really means a lot for you to take time to do this with me. Yeah. Thanks for uh, making the trip out, Alex. Yeah. Anytime. It's good anytime. to have you here. Yeah. I'm glad to be on your beautiful farm property. Um, it's been nice. We'll dig into it later, but it's been nice to see both your farm properties from the old one and now bent your your new property. Yeah, I get to see the whole whole picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see things grow and change. Uh, so, if we're getting further into it, um, what's the name of your farm? Uh, where you're located, and uh, how large is is your uh, farm currently? Okay, so uh, the name of the farm is Garden Fort. Uh, we are in Dexter, Michigan, which is uh, about 20 minutes west of Ann Arbor. Um, about uh, an hour out of Detroit. We are, well, we're situated here on 35 acres um, on our, our new farm, um, but we work about an acre of ground. Uh, that's actual like bed space. Um, so we are setting up that acre of ground on like a six to seven acre field. It'll turn into maybe about three acres of Okay. Of kind of field space, bed space. Uh, we are we produce primarily salad greens. Okay. Um, we do a few kind of fall carrot crops and stuff like that, or you know sometimes we experiment, throw things into the mix, but primarily our bread and butter is just uh, lots of salad greens, lettuce mix, a greens mix. It's like lots of uh, brassicas, um, things that you can cook cook down you know like greens that can be salad or yeah. tossed into stir fry and stuff like that uh spinach um, and arugula and pea shoots and sunflower shoots in the greenhouse and we run primarily pretty much year round um you know keeping the greenhouse going we have two uh Actually, no, we're, we're about to have three. We have two up already. Uh, eighth of an acre hoop houses. Uh, and we'll, we'll have three uh, sometime. <laughs> In the near future, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we got a long list of projects going on. Yeah, yeah. Moving a farm. <laughs> so how long have you been at this current property for? So we moved here. We haven't been here quite a year yet. It's, it's mid-March now. And we moved here in... Uh, I think it was April 7th okay. last year. Okay, so pretty new on the property. Pretty new, big transition year last year. We were, um, so we had to, to go back to just 
where we started, we started on a two and a half acre property in, uh, in South Line, which is about half an hour north of here. And um, we had about half an acre of production there. And we, in, let's see, in 2018, we kind of outgrew it. And at the same time, there was a farm down the road that had just gone out of business uh, about five minutes down the road in, in Brighton, uh, just across the highway, essentially. And uh, it became available to lease. So we took over a lease there um, early 2019. And first, we also purchased uh, three 30 by 144 Rimal Nor'easter uh high tunnels that were at that farm and then we just like rented the ground that they were on uh to start with and then we we grew from there uh we were able to like grow into like said about an acre of production uh at that site and you know into 2020 it was kind of perfect timing we'd already planned to to try to double our growth or double our size and uh 2020 happened and the the demand for local food just uh escalated of course we were like um at the time like 60 percent uh direct to retail and about 40 percent uh restaurants okay so it was a bit of a hold your breath moment (laughs) it was like 40 percent of your business (laughs) overnight yeah um but we kind of just sat still and it turned out that everybody needed to buy more groceries so all our uh, retail accounts like doubled and tripled wow just on their own we didn't really have to uh make any kind of move there um so it's you just said, such a long story. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. So, <laughs> so you said so you, you you rented that property out, yeah. and are those tunnels you have here are the tunnels you had at that original piece of property you moved. Yeah, moved this yeah. Room over here. So yeah. So to fast forward, we whatever we grew there went really well, um, but we were very land insecure there. Um, there was all, often lots of people coming to look at the property, and uh, our lease was like year to year. Mm, yeah. Um, and we talked a bit about buying it, but the price of land in that area was just too high. And we, we could have maybe made it work on like a small piece, but then we would be kind of limited in our growth and, um, kind of wanted to keep going from past what we would have, we would hit a ceiling there that I I don't think would have been happy with. So, so you said now that you're, you're. Focusing mainly on green crops, salads, um, the, the fall roots. Um, has your farm always been focused heavily on this, or is this, is this something that's been evolved over the, the last few years? It's evolved. Uh, we started at farmers markets uh, and kind of grew everything. Um, we were doing two farmers markets there for a few years, and uh, kind of hit hit a ceiling there. Um, Even with growing, you know, it's like you grow as much diversity as you can. You try to fill your table so that every every one of your loyal customers, you know, fills a good bag full of stuff. Uh, But we were just not making enough money. Uh, We, you know, we were doing okay kind of during the summer, and and then summer would be over, and (laughs) I'd have to go back to my my old job and you know hustle up some freelance design work in in the winter time and get through. Uh, and so that was, that was getting old. Um, and, um, it was six years ago. Uh, well, actually almost seven now, my first daughter was born. And when that happened, it was just like, okay, can, I can't work sun up to sundown anymore. You know, I don't really want to be working on the weekends. Um, just a real like evaluation of what, you know, you really start to look into the future, uh, when, <laughs> when your life changes like that <laughs> um so yeah it, it just and obviously the money wasn't working and i i, I didn't i left my design career because i was kind of tired of it and um i didn't want to have to keep dipping back into that plus i was like you know i was losing the passion in there so when i did do that work i felt more and more like i wasn't showing up 
in the way that I should be yeah. as well. So I was looking for ways to get out of that. And, you know, one thing I was looking for was like, how could I have a longer season? Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, beyond farmer's markets, most of them end. There are winter farmer's markets and stuff like that. And then how can we just make more money without having to go to like six farmer's markets yeah. or something like that? <laughs> so, so, so kind of dialing that crop selection to things you can do more more year round, little higher profit margin crops, kind of narrow things in a little bit. Yep. Yep. So we made the decision, quit in farmer's markets. Uh, we'd had been working with a couple stores already and, uh, had, had some ways in and a few restaurants and decided, yeah, just to, to really evaluate all the crops, look at profitability, how much time they were taking. Um, even like, how heavy are they yeah, you know yeah. like how much physical effort am i gonna put into this and um and yeah and it, the first year i think we cut it down to like 16 crops or something like that and then from there just every year it was just like slicing more and more yeah. just really taking that that uh kind of 80 20 you know the those uh that 20 percent that was bringing all the return um and that dialed us into greens more and more there's other crops that were were good too you know like radishes and turnips and stuff but it just was they're harder to sell yeah. especially once we we really got we started to get into more stores and it was just it's just easy to put something in a clamshell put a sticker on it the sticker tells the story you know it's going to tell you the brand, the products, you know, you can say something about whether it's ready to eat or, you know, we, we've labeled it as like more organic. Yeah. Um, or right now it says soil grown on the package, like just any point of difference, you can, you can let that package do a good amount of the talking on the shelf. Um, so that, that made it easy for us to get into some of these stores that maybe, you know, they're getting pressured to carry local products, but they just don't know how to talk about it themselves. Yeah. And so it was, it's, it was just an easy way in to be able to design a package and, and let that do a lot of the work and, uh, you know, just moving it through the stores. And then that continued to be successful and scale and picked up, became more and more popular, more and more stores reaching out. You know, for a while we pushed Instagram pretty hard. Um, and we're able to get a few more stores interested in us through that platform. Um, and yeah, and it's just, it's just grown from there. And I bet there are probably a lot of folks listening who are, let's say, on the edge of making a big decision like that, right? They're trying to either go in a direction, trying to align out springtime or all trying to make those big decisions right now. What was that like going from a predominantly farmer's market, you know, based business to say, now we're switching to this? That's a, that's a big jump. Yeah. It was, it was terrifying. It's risk. And it, yeah, it was a huge risk. And, um, I mean, really, <laughs> it's not that different than starting a farm because <laughs> you don't know what you're doing then. Um, and, you know, I didn't know what I was doing for that next part either. Um, I, I don't know. I just had, I just had faith that it was either going to work or not. And I wasn't, I just didn't want to keep doing the same thing. Yeah. Cause I knew that that wasn't going to work for, for me and my family. Yeah. And, and it sounds like yeah, you had this you know, birth of your child, a, a, a real decision making, pro, you know, a crossroads to make a decision. And I've seen a lot of farms, especially post COVID who, you know, been going to markets for their entire lives. You know, they didn't have a child, but you know, COVID happened and they're like, yeah. wait a second. What am I doing? Yeah. I, I got to align what, what are my values in this moment. And it's, I've seen a lot of people the last few years either, you know, leaving markets, going to a farm stand model, you know, on, on an on farm model, something that's closer to home, closer to the family, or going fully to the wholesale, something like that as well, just because, you know, they've spent their entire, me personally, I spent my entire life at the markets. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't have to go for a little bit. Oh, man, my, my life is, you know, your priorities change when you, you know, when you have the opportunity to think of them differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's tough to think about like, you know, all those relationships you have and everything like that. That's probably the hardest part. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when it comes down to when you take a moment to step back and think about what you need for yourself and um, 
<laughs> time is precious yeah you know? and it's, uh, yeah. i think for me especially with uh with having kids it's like you know that that time is just not gonna last so you know you don't want to miss it no 100 percent. it's so valuable uh yeah and it's so easy because you could always work more at the farm there's always a thousand jobs yeah. you could work from you, know, you probably would work another five more hours a day if you wanted to right but you know having those limits will set say here's what we're doing and then yeah. working within those those uh those boundaries yeah and that was another thing that happened at that time too is that we we really switched to being a you know eight hour day mm -hmm. five days a week working farm um not to say that you know sometimes i don't come in and do book work or whatever or you know maybe there's a push on a saturday every once in a while or something but like for the most part just trying to keep a standard schedule um to allow for that yeah. that time with my family and make sure that it actually happens and put those limits around everything. No, I totally agree. And that's something you know, I've been working towards our entire entire farming because I don't have any children yet, but the idea is that, oh, we're, I want to have a family. I want to have people around me and I want to have a system set up so that when the time comes, I can, I can do that. So I, I feel like having that eight hour, you know, eight to nine hour work limit really allows me personally, I don't know about you, to come in hit it hard dial in and then i can just okay then i'm done i'm just going home yeah if you're working you're working and yeah and it's great and then it uh you know i think the real plus side of it is that um you know there's only so much you can do and then and then you got to figure out how to bring other people on board and then that really opens things up as well i mean you get more ideas from people working with you you get to understand your workflow a little bit better you get you just get your systems even more tight dialed in because you know you don't want somebody else just running the clock on you yeah. that kind of thing um that, that that's actually a great transition so beyond yourself um you said kind of 40 40 hours plus you know 40 hour farmer plus yeah. um who else who else is working on the farm here with you uh so right now i have two people on on the farm with me um one is you know four or five days a week and it's it's a bit of a different situation right now because we're still building um you know we still we're still we're building a new wash pack in, a, in our barn right now and um we got a, we got a deer fence to build we got another tunnel to finish we, it's just been a series of, of projects um coming out of that the the farm last year um so i have a full-time person with me right now actual farm work that we do each week um is you know it's 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 mid-march so we're we're harvesting spinach you know like four hours a week and then we're and bringing in some greens mix we're spending a day in the wash pack and then uh, a day on the road and now now i got uh, another person uh who's gonna drive the delivery truck for me starting next week oh nice uh, so that'll free up my Fridays again, and um, and they're also going to take over some of the the greenhouse work. So we're just starting to to seed lettuce starts and start start our uh, shoots production back up. So I got somebody lined up to take care of that. Uh, so you know, a, a part timer, maybe what's that? Maybe like 10, 10 12 hours a week, uh, and then we got yeah. Uh, my full timers, but thirty to forty hours a week, depending on uh, how much time they have as yeah. well. They have childcare responsibilities yeah. and things too, so it's a bit of a juggling act. But uh, we're making it work. But we will have, uh, we'll need because we have all these projects going on. We'll, we'll need another uh, like four or five day a week uh, kind of farm hand help. Okay, and then we'll be trying to get somebody else uh like a day or two a week just to help us pack in the in the wash pack okay so so to so this original person will stay on still doing a lot more building <laughs> you have a lot of projects still come to happen kind of heading that off and then the person will come in and help with more field labor production stuff that help assist you with that a little more yeah sounds like. yeah so we're a little inflated on labor compared to what we would normally be or will be this this season um <clears throat> just because we're we're still we're we're building a new farm. Yeah. Um, but we have our, our systems are pretty dialed now that we're, uh, you know, we, we can really do quite a bit with not that much labor. 
Yeah. yeah. It really just comes into, you know, wash pack. Yeah. I makes total sense. And it's nice to have someone who can, who's in headline working on those projects. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really lucky. Um, it's, it's uh, Ben Hicks. He actually has his own farm, Black Locust Gardens. Um, and he's set up, he's helped set up, there used to be a farm called Sunseed in okay. our area. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, ben did a ton of infrastructure work for. He's helped do infrastructure projects at Nature and Nurture Seeds. Really? So he's very well versed um, in like farm infrastructure. So nice. It's just awesome to have another mind to kind of take on some of that. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a huge it's a huge burden. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but it's also like I I talk to a lot of farmers and like you I really you really hear farmers bringing in people to help with infra. I you know, I don't hear often like you just, I I take I you know I do this do the infrastructure work and I come do the other yeah. labor. But it sounds like you've really found somebody specialized in building farms and you know yeah kind of, or or specialized in working people you know in that type of processes. Yeah, it's it's dumb luck really. I mean, he's just he's been a good friend of mine. Uh, since I've been in this area, we we met each other in uh, 2013 when I was starting my farm, and he was working at another farm called Valley View that was only existed for a year, um, but it was up in the same area, so we ended up uh, it was buying like chicken feed from them or something, yeah. and we, we started hanging out. <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's it's I mean those people don't really exist. Yeah, the problem. Um, so it's it's cool that you know just by by luck i i have access to to ben and he's my friend and he's around and it was just like you know oh i've done trenching work before so i actually just hired him initially just to run all our hydrants to our tunnels and get everything ready because we're putting in a new well too um and then it just kind of went from there and then he's He's a farmer too, so it's just like, okay, well, I guess now I'll help you harvest finish. And, <laughs> you know, after my other full timer ended at at the end of last year, he was just like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll help you just do everything else. You know, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's great. You found someone to like build that team, with, you know, locally. That's that's super cool. Yeah, yeah, that's it's, great. it's great. So you're saying, you know, uh, to talk to a little bit earlier, so you're focusing heavily uh, on the salad mix. So uh, you, you saw that you said retail um, directly to at least like grocery stores, cooperatives. What type of businesses are you working with to sell that product? Yeah. So actually, I should say it's retailers, restaurants, and then aggregators is another uh, a big one, um, inclu- including you. Yeah, including I've myself. Sold, sold stuff to, to Alex uh, for his CSA. Um, and then there's, there's a, a really awesome um, – CSA at um, St. Joe's. Yeah, St. Joe's Hospital. It's a hospital. Yesterday. Yeah. And, uh, geez, what are they running now? Like 300 shares or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. And yeah. they're just sourcing from all different farms in the area. And uh, it's such a good fit for us because, you know, that way we can just basically double up a planting of lettuce or something like that and be able to, to pack uh, for those kinds of shares. So we love that. Um, yeah. So the retail stuff is um, mo- it's mostly small, uh, like come mo- mom and pop um, grocers. Okay. Um, but we we do have like pretty much all of them are family businesses, but some of them, you know, they're scaled. Uh, there's there's one in um, we, Southfield that we drop off at, and it's actually from there it goes to two different or you know it stays at that store and then it goes to two other stores as well yeah uh and it's just that the family owns like a series of of different stores um and uh there's a really good one in ferndale is kind of like a hip place you know yeah, it's yeah. been a really good market for us uh western market it's just like a nice kind of specialty grocery store um so yeah it's 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 pretty much just mom and pop retailers uh, at, at the moment. Yeah. How have you been growing that? How have you been finding these people? Or is it something like where people are talking to each other like, oh yeah, I know a guy who, just, who does amazing spinach and I have to pass it over. You have to go out there and find those accounts yeah. usually. Um, so we work. It's, it, it's interesting. For the most part, I haven't, they've all come, come to me. Perfect. They've found me um, and in different ways. Like, there's a 
aggregator called Grow Eastern Market. Um, and we, when we first started working with them, I just sent them like a bunch of samples just to take to all their different, they relay things to restaurants and stuff like that. So they relayed some pea shoots to Supino's, which is a pizza shop. And then he's married to one of the owners <laughs> of the store, one of the stores that we got into. So she just was, you know, she reached out to me and was just like, hey, you know, I got this stuff this way and it looks amazing. Are you like retail ready? And it's just like, yeah, yeah, we are. So, uh, you know, got going that way. And then we were, when we first kind of jumped off of farmer's markets, I kind of made it a point to just be really heavy on Instagram. And at the time, I think Instagram was a little bit more like fruitful yeah. than it maybe is now. I, I, maybe I'm just not trying hard anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> at the time, it was pretty cool because I was kind of, you know, posting on a regular basis and trying to find places I might be interested in selling at and following them and trying to just whatever, make those connections. And we, we got into... Uh, at least three different stores that way. And uh, you don't need to get too deep into it, but how have you found that these stores have been with pricing? Like working with a local supplier, have they been, you know, like, oh, we need your price a little lower. Is this, this works for our, our clientele. How's that been going? Um, we've never really had anyone push back on our price. Um, I, I kind of had to learn what that markup was and where I could price my product to at. And, and, and then, you know, knowing what inside the farm, what kind of return I'm looking to get, um, which, you know, about $9 a pound, nine, $10 a pound right now is like what I'm trying to get. And if I'm packaging it into a bag, I can sell it for $3 and the store can sell it for five and make their, their markup. Um, and I can still make $9 a pound at the end of the day. Of course, a little extra labor in a bag, the material cost is down. What happened, we did start originally in only clamshells because um, it's just a nice presentation, keeps yeah. the product really, really well. Um, but through the pandemic, prices on clamshells basically tripled. Wow. Um, so... You know, we were selling clamshell product, I think, for before the pandemic at like three twenty five a pop. We were cut you know, it was costing maybe thirty cents for a clamshell or something like that, maybe not even that much, like a quarter. So we were just covering that cost. Yeah. And uh after that price escalated that much, I we decided we'd switch to bags. I guess it's technically like shrinkflation, right? Yeah, you yeah. make you like cut things on your end <laughs> to try to keep your price stable. And so, you know, about half of our customers switched to bags, and we were able to kind of keep our price steady. Um, and then half of them decided that they wanted to keep clamshells, and so we have to sell those for like four dollars each. And okay. then they end up retailing at like six, six fifty. Um, and it's, you know, we're we're pushing price. At all those, I mean, especially at the clamshell locations, you know, that's more than you're going to have to pay for anything from California yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it, it's still working. Yeah. And it's nice, too, that you gave them the option to choose what they want, that flexibility, so they can dial in on what their clientele need and what, what, what works best for their store. Because really, they know on some level what's going to move you know, yeah. through their, their operations. So it's nice yeah. to give them the option to... You know, to do, you know, yeah. the badge of the clam show. Yeah, or whatever. totally. It's funny. I think most of the people that stick to clamshells, I think they're just stuck in their shelves. <laughs> yeah. Like they have the backfilled shelves oh, that are like yeah. spring, spring loading, you're pushing your clamshells forward. And so they're just, yeah, that's they just to. what they have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's a system that, yeah. Yeah. So, but they also have the clientele that are, are 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 willing to pay too. So to have that little more premium feel, maybe maybe, maybe that's what it is—the premium feeling products. Yeah. Um, and you also sell. To, I've seen your stuff in quite a few like the local address, uh, 
what do they call it? not aggregating store, but what do they call them? Uh, consignment, grocery store. Consignment. Yeah, yeah. I've seen the, some of your products at the stores. We there. love that stuff. We, uh, yeah, so, you know, the consignment model is amazing because we can still sell our bag for $5, but we take home 75%. So it's like we get 375 for Perfect. That. Yeah. So it's like a higher value, um, which is great. You know, it's just, they're just taking a, a smaller margin. I mean, I, I always kind of hope that it's working well for them. And it seems like it is. Yeah. Um, because compared to other stores, like we've had, we have, we have stores we've worked with that just whatever your price is, they just double it, you know? And then some people are really content to whatever 50% or even 30%. Um, so it's just like every it's all over the map yeah and so you just got to be set on your price and just make sure you're getting what you need and then they can kind of figure out how much they want to push it as far as like the branding of the product and how it looks you use these bags they're a little skinnier than mm-hmm. than other bags i've seen and at the at the uh, the markets when i've seen them there the they stand out and and they stand out more than i would say other bagged green products at, at the at those places uh which is half just me just you know you know <laughs> building up a little bit but also they look fantastic when i go there you can see your products specifically on the shelf right? yep. the branding's great oh there's garden fort greens yep. right when everybody else is like uh the traditional like square bag with the same label kind of half skewed you know yeah, 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 yeah. but yours is prominent it's beautiful yeah. Well, it's, you know, it helps to have gone to art school and have a design <laughs> background. And I, I worked in, um, I actually worked in that industry for a while. I designed packaging for the grocery store for like craft foods. So I understand, uh, basically like the visual hierarchy and, um, you know, shelf impact and just what uh, shopability is a big one. So it's like, a lot of people tend to maybe want to celebrate their brand like a lot, put their logo on there really big, or even make their uh, sticker so big that it's like covering your product. Mm. And your product is like the best looking thing you got, yeah. at, at least, you know, most of the time. Um, so, you know, celebrating the, the product, but also having that good shop ability so that you can just see, Oh, arugula, like from across the store, you know, you can see big arugula. Um, and then just whatever else it needs, to, whatever mental box it needs to, to check in people's minds. Like, is it local? Is it, is it organic or, you know, is it clean? Yeah. Um, so delivering that information as the next point of hierarchy and then just having the brand, be expressed like through your type choices or whatever little complimentary graphics you have on there instead of making your logo like super huge. Yeah. Yeah. And it's total. And I like, the, it's also like, a, it sounds silly, like, like a bad feel, like the bad feels full and like, my firm isn't the right word to use, but like, you know what I mean? Like you hold, grab onto it and you feel like, Oh, this is substantial. Man, this, it feels like substantial because I, because it, it, the bag's filled full. It's not too tight, not too loose. Where the other ones you can grab it and you kind of feel like an, uh, in some other products, even myself, when I've done it, uh, it was like, Oh, it feels airy. Like it feels like loose. Uh, and this product feels like a tight product so that, that's yeah. weird to say yeah yeah, yeah. That that's definitely a, a deliberate <laughs> choice as well yeah with the, the the size of the bag it's you know you don't want it to just feel like a floppy nothing in your hand it's like if it's the greens are packed in there and it feels full there's a bit of air in there you know and it feels good it's it fits in your hand nicely yeah um there's a lot of that that yeah. it's just really subtle like positive reinforcement and from the CS, from my side, you know, we, we, we buy some greens in for our CSA. And they pack really well in bags. Like they yeah. you get them in there nice. And it's not like they don't get squished. They fit really well inside there. So I yeah. love that. That's the other thing too. Yeah. We're because we are distributing like a lot of units, you know, being able to pack them into boxes to distribute and make sure they come out on the other end the way that we want them. Um, 
that's all thought out as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, which is, which is kind of like made those bad to I asked earlier, you know, were you nervous about dumping into this? But it's like, you know, you have a direction and you have an idea behind it, some spirits behind this type of thing. Yeah. So if it, that can probably help, you know, calm down and help it give you more direction when you're getting stars yeah. like this. Yeah. It was definitely like an intentional sort of tapping into your superpowers. It's just like, what skills do I have? What can I leverage here to set myself apart from other farmers and, get into different markets and yeah it's like yeah got to use those skills <laughs> yeah you have to it's cutthroat you got to uh maybe kind of the same line uh you know you're on the shelf and that's to all these other producers you know it's a uh, it's it's at the grocery store uh do you ever see like a uh you know a pushback from let's say other farms like competition from other producers who are doing a similar uh, prod like that. Have you seen like any effect of like you know sales because of competition anything like that? You know, the I think the my favorite part about and it, it, it'll probably happen. Yeah, but and it does set like the farm stops and stuff. So there's a, there's competition there. Um, but again, I think we're we're keeping it tighter than they are, and it it shows, and you know we're and down to the product too, you know, like if the product's not up to snuff, like we're not, we're not going to put it out there, you know, people, negative, negative feedback in people's minds are harder to get rid of than, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, positive. So, you know, you don't want to bring in anything bad. Um, yeah, but as in, in the bigger retailers, the, the non-farm stop stuff, it's uh, so far we haven't seen any really. There's some like hydroponic local products in that space, um, but it's it's a different it's a different product. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that everyone's totally hip to. I don't know. I, I don't know that they recognize that hydroponic. I don't know. Hydroponic makes a lot of claims and stuff like that. Yeah, it's yeah. Just like, I don't know that they recognize that so grown products might be different than hydroponic. Um, they might just, a lot of times, a lot of the feedback that we've gotten really has been about local. Like all our store owners are just like, nobody cares about organic, whatever. They just want local. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and all the hydroponic product that is local is priced cheaper than us. You know, so we are more premium, but I do think that like when you actually experience our product, it has a better, um, you know, it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. The, the flavor profiles, you know, yeah. Winter sweetened spinach and yeah. brassicas and stuff like that. So you can't even compare it. Yeah. You, you can't compare an overwintered soil grown spinach and flavor to like an, a hydro grown, fully heated, protected, protected tr product. It's a different taste yeah. consistency is different thing yeah and it's funny at I, I, our local co-op we have a, a local hydro producer who, who who sells there and i'm not trying to knock any of the production not 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 their their, their product but i look look at it in, in, in the clamshells and it just doesn't it looks kind of light and kind of like airy i, I looked at it, it doesn't it doesn't have like a heft to it that I, uh that i see kind of coming from a soil grown product and whether that's because of the greenhouse nature it was grown in you know fully controlled you know year round what, what, what would it be but having your product next to that i can imagine being you know, a pretty good like uh you know they can see yours side by side although there's you know, it's a quality difference maybe a different product difference yeah i, I, I hope so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well um so i mean on the same line have you developed any items any products with you know feedback from like from grocers or is anything that's like developed from those relationships as far as products not really um you know we, we we had a bit of i think microgreens a couple years ago really had a moment of popularity uh so we were being asked to maybe produce a few different microgreen products um but we just we didn't do it <laughs> we we, we kind of started to develop that but uh, ultimately just decided not to. Yeah. And I, 
I don't know if it's there's more other people producing now, but we are we are seeing our numbers on microgreens like not not steeply decline, but you know they're they're not moving like they were when they were a little bit more novel. Yeah, more fast. So thing. it's you, you know it'll settle out, and we'll see like where that actually lands. Yeah, and I mean on, on that say microgreens line, it seems like it's kind of one of the lower and en- bare to entry, let's say ag right. fields. So especially in the area, you have people who, who are trying to get into it. I can see, you know, it's easy and easy out. You have a lot of, a lot of people start my green farms. It's yeah. Like easy to see like, yeah. Start one in your basement. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Like no problem. But. Yeah. It, it, I just see it being to like a uh, level of like volatility or like unsureness of like, you know, the demand for this product because, and also I think there are quite a few local producers who, are pretty large do microgreens. There's, there's, there's a lot of people in the area who who yeah who, who, who do it. Um, so I can imagine. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Today's episode of the No Till Market Garden podcast is brought to you by Tilt Soil. This Cleveland, Ohio-based company is producing some of the highest quality potting mixes out there. One of the biggest lessons I learned in farming is the importance of good seed starting mixes, and that's why I included Till Soil in my book and have been using their seed starting mix sprout on my farm since 2020. Till Soil produces potting mixes approved for use in organic operations like our own. Their living soil is made with fully composted food waste they collect and process themselves. Whether you need a cubic yard super sack once a year or ongoing deliveries for your year-round operation, Tilth has you covered. The team at Tilth can help with shipping, coordination, and provide ongoing support throughout the growing season. To learn more, visit www.tilthsoil.com. That's tilthsoil.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Real Organic Project. Does your farm deserve to be recognized for all the hard work done on behalf of the environment and your community? Real Organic Project is an add-on certification that partners with 1,000-plus certified organic farms across North America, including my own farm, Rough Draft Farmstead. Available at no cost to farmers and with minimal time commitment, it is a great way to differentiate your farm from mass-marketed corporate organic where hydroponic production and animal confinement are still commonplace. Real Organic Project is a whole farm certification program to distinguish crops grown in healthy soils and livestock raised humanely on pasture. As a farmer-led movement, we know many hands make for quick work. I hope you will lend yours by signing up for Real Organic Project certification today. Visit realorganicproject.org slash no-till to apply. That's realorganicproject.org slash no-till to apply. All right, back to the show. Let's talk about maybe like a a traditional like bed flip, and, you know. So from let's say, let's say old crop of spinach there, how do you how do you go from that to your next crop? Yeah. So my favorite uh, bed flip scenario is in the main field growing season when it's nice and warm out. Say it's a bed of arugula. We'll harvest it, you know, as much as we need. And then just tarp it. We just tarp it. Yeah. We don't do anything. We just put a tarp on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, a week or two later, uh, we can peel the tarp back and a good amount of that is going to be broken down and um, just vanished. Yeah. Just turn, turned back into soil, eaten by earthworms, whatever it is. Um, and then we're just going to just do a bit of raking. Um, if, if it's maybe a, a crop that's been in longer, say it was like a spring arugula that we cut like three times, it's got like coarser stems on it or something like that. We might have to go in, um, with a, like the rotary harrow. So that's, if we're working the soil, that's pretty much what we're going to be using, uh, rotary harrow on a BCS. Um, and we'll just run that through just to finish ripping that up um if we feel like we need to i mean sometimes we can just like rake in an amendment and whatever like chicken manure or something and and then just seed right over top of it we're using the jang to seed uh we just started using the five row which is awesome um so yeah that's that's primarily how we we kind of burn and turn and we're we're planting fresh beds every week. So in the main season, you know, we're not trying to get recuts. Uh, We're just planning on having that crop finish, tarp it out. We try to, it's funny in the summer, it's like, it looks 
the least productive <laughs> because all these crops that we were doing they're you know 30 days or less um so there's really only like three series of crops going at a time yeah generally so like you know we might have we might have maybe like 12 beds of each item out in the field and then the rest of it's tarped yeah because it you know it's crops that were finished and it's beds ready to go so yeah it looks the least productive and then as we get into fall we can we, you know we basically plant everything out fill fill all the beds um we do we did just do a turnover of so that's the ideal situation you know the that kind of being able to tarp it and just rake it that's it pretty minimal um but this time of year you know we're flipping a tunnel uh we just took out our winter overwintered greens mix you know which was like tot soy mizuna um baby kale so for that <clears throat> since we just need to get into the beds really fast um and it's like an eighth of an acre in a, a tunnel you know it's a 30 by 192 tunnel uh we're running the rotary harrow through it okay. and that's really nice at just like ripping everything out and just laying it on the surface yeah and then we'll just let it dry out for a couple of days so that raking isn't super laborious and then we just rake up the debris um maybe hit it again with the harrow maybe go in with a scuffle just to touch up and clean out anything that didn't get ripped out um but that's pretty minimal hit it again maybe with the harrow to put in some amendments uh, and then we'll plant it again so yeah. it's like really you know we're trying not to do too much work that we don't have to do we've really pared it down a lot um and that's that's it yeah yeah it's very super lean it's not super yeah. lean quick and it's like i i think people really underestimate like, like no tell so many other so many other great uh you know perks from it but just that the, the time saving just pulling a tarp over let it sit and then coming back and planting i find yeah. it's, it's, I, I see it as like automation yeah it's just it's automating bread pet bed bed prep yeah <laughs> Automated bed prep. Yeah. yeah. No, 100%. Especially if you get getting those, if you have enough land to move your production through that yeah. and then pull the tarps over instead of going out there with a, a crew. Like Ty mentioned earlier about paring down labor, automating as much as, much as possible. This is a good good example of that. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of, I, I think it's one of those things that, you know, we're, we're when we're talking about you know uh, uh let's say tillage practices you know like the, yeah the, the, the no till it has a other a lot of other bonuses from it but just being able to you know do so like the process of pulling a tarp over and put some sandbags is so less labor intensive than even getting machinery out or some on some on some times uh or it can be even more peaceful i find too just not having yeah. to run that or the, the fossil fuels to the cost to run the machinery on yeah and the labor to maintain all that stuff on top of it you just gotta move some slimy types around. <laughs> yeah, I mean sometimes they're a little bit slimy. <laughs> we had to cut down all of ours like super skinny because you know it, it really it comes down to how many people you have to move tarps. Yeah, so I, I went to a friend's farm and you know they had what a thirty by a hundred and there was a foot of water between every bed and it took us like you know, four or five hours to get all the water off of that. Yeah, off of, of, of all of that, do you ever run into any issues of like maintaining that um, with your crew? Or yeah, so I was actually, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because it's something I haven't even really thought about, but uh, recently, and it's um, all our beds are 45 feet long, so like a 50 foot long tarp is just perfect over top of it. Uh, you know, a 30 foot wide. Uh, sorry, let me back up um all, all of our beds are 45 feet so 50 foot tarp covers it perfectly and then we call a block uh eight beds wide so uh with that's with one inch or one foot pathways so that's about 30 feet so like a 30 by 50 tarp is kind of our biggest size tarp that we have to deal with and that's pretty perfect for two people to manage even if it's covered in like ice yeah. you can still get it off um and it's also doable with one person so if you're if you're stuck out there by yourself you know it's it's 
doable. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty slick with, with just two people. Um, so yeah, keeping things in that, those kinds of proportions just really, you know, it's just, it's human scale. It's like, once you get up past that, you know, like a hundred foot tarp is, it's pretty big. And then, you know, once you're even bigger than that, then it's just like, then you're talking about different systems. Yeah. You know, getting, getting out of tarps and stuff like that. And, and I kind of feel like keeping those bed lengths, you know, 45 feet humans, I, human scale that like it's also like psychological that when you're not having to walk down a 150 foot row or picking a 150 row of like radishes or whatever yeah. when you can look down a 45 foot row like, you know that's a in my head that's a doable yeah. amount of like work but i'm sitting down like, at the end of like, a 200 foot row of like picking lettuce i'm like oh geez there's no way it's, it's a yeah. for me, it just hits even though it's saying even it could be four 50 foot rows or one 200 foot row the four fifty seems seems psychologically seems so much more you know doable yeah yeah didn't go out there. Yeah, the you know the only it's like as I scale more, it becomes more like how many times do I want to like turn the cedar around or the the BCS around or whatever it is. Yeah, because it's like okay, yeah, maybe if I had a hundred foot beds, you know, I'd be doing longer passes with those, and and then you're you know you you're trading it somewhere else. Yeah. A hundred percent. So you mentioned earlier kind of fertility using some, some chicken manure. Is that kind of the main chicken manure and compost? Are those the main inputs? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'll, I'll just, you know, our, how we actually are breaking into the ground. Like we are going to, we, we do till to, to break in. Um, and then we're, we're doing the, the classic kind of top dress, you know, like these eighth of an acre tunnels we brought in. 25 yards of compost for each one and, and top dress them to, to start with. And, and really like we'll be feeding that soil even more. Uh, just, it, it just needs it, yeah. you know, just to try to get that right soil conditioning where, it, it, the, you know, you can actually rake in amendments and stuff like that. You get that nice like tilth. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And then we, yeah, we're, we're, not always adding we i like to do all my compost like in like bulk um i, I was actually hoping for more cold this winter to, <laughs> yeah. to spread like all my compost just while the ground was was frozen just do it all with the tractor um but we'll be probably just doing it with with wheelbarrows and stuff like that so we're not compacting the 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 fields um and then we're not always at, so yeah, we're not going to add compost between every crop or anything. Like we're trying to just do that, like just throw a lot on every year or two as, as we see that we need it. Yeah. Um, and then um, with, we are using primarily chicken manure. We've done some like alfalfa meal and stuff like that in the past, but chicken manure is just a good, good hit of nitrogen. Um, I am the, the, my long view, I do really want to figure out something maybe better. Uh, and maybe it's a cover cropping system or something to, to fix nitrogen, uh, just cause we're growing mostly greens. It'd be nice if we were just mostly feeding the soil nitrogen since that's what's coming out Yeah, yeah. so that we're not building up like phosphorus or something like that. Like over time yeah that, that, that could become a problem you know yeah i didn't think about that it's such a, if, if you're probably doing just greens you don't have any other type of crops in there yeah. that are pulling as much i'm assuming as you know it's like a tomato a tomato plant would pull yeah uh, compared to like, like a you know, head, of, head of lettuce or you know whatever yeah um, yeah i didn't think about that it's kind of that yeah and, and, and because yeah greens you know they don't they don't pull that much so you know, I kind of am just looking at the the previous crops and evaluating like, is it does it still look like there's enough like juice in here so that we don't have to throw anything down? And um, it's a real I don't know I'm it's just all feel for me. Yeah, I don't, I'm not very scientific about it. <laughs> no, <I didn't. laughs> I'm not like taking soil samples every week or anything like that. So. But you know, but you you know the crop is supposed to look like. You understand your system. So if it's if it's working for it, why you know why mess up when it's working? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I think just in the future, as we as we uh, get get deeper into this, it's like just 
something I want to do is try to tighten that up a little bit. Yeah. As, as far as just like I was saying, just long term, like I don't want to don't want to ruin my soil long term. <laughs> not a good idea. No, that makes, that makes total sense. And and as you you said in, uh, a little earlier, uh, what's kind of your soil type? What's what do you go? What are you starting with? And like, how was the like, compost working with that? Like, is it, it was it heavy soils when you got here? Yeah. So this is a change for me. I was spoiled at my first <laughs> site. I had sandy loam, sandy subsoil, um, which was really nice. But it was a bit of a. Ch- it was nice to. It was super easy to work. Okay. Uh, it was a bit of a challenge to hold on to nutrients. Um, so I was having to like amend constantly. Um, and then my next site was a bit of a mix. So it was kind of like a sandy loam uh, topsoil, but then you, you, we did have some like clay subsoil and more of a, it was just a bit more loamy, thick soil. Um, so that gave me a little bit more play. Like I didn't necessarily have to amend it all the time. This soil is, we got about a foot of loam and then it's all clay subsoil. Okay. So it's like, you know, it's way stickier. I'm not going to be able to, it's going to take me longer to get into the fields in the springtime when they're wet and it takes longer, you know, holds moisture a lot longer. Um, so it's, it's going to be a new experience for me. Um, compost is always the good mediator like across any soil type like you know it's going to give you that that tilt that you want and and help moderate moisture and uh, nutrients and stuff like that but I do feel better about the sort of the depth of nutrients Mm. on this site Um, just having that that thicker soil yeah I do feel like it's going to serve me really well in the long term to hold hold on to the, the nutrients a little more not just like, yeah run right I, i'm not washing anything away anymore yeah um yeah so i don't know i can't speak too much to it we're, we're literally in our first crop right now so <laughs> um so far so good though okay it's, it's looking really nice <laughs> next year we'll come back we'll have a little plug in <laughs> yeah. how's the soil doing you know after, after a year we'll, we'll, we'll plug it in there later <laughs> yeah yeah uh, that's awesome uh and you mentioned earlier uh you said you had nor'easters what, what, what are the tunnels you have again uh, on site yeah rimal nor'easters nor'easters okay and um let's see when we purchased them they were originally 30 by 144s okay and when we moved them to this new site we basically purchased like an extra 144 feet of material okay to extend each tunnel 48 feet Okay, it makes sense. If you can yeah. do all that. Yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> so now they're 30 by 192s, which is essentially an eighth of an acre. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, my plan is to just keep building tunnels a lot more. <laughs> yeah. More and more. It's, I love being a winter grower. It's so much fun. It's, 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 it's For me personally, it's my favorite time. This it's time to grow. Yeah. He's put in the ground and just like. Yeah, and it's so nice. You know, we, we burn and turn through crops all summer long and you don't really like. Like you're not spending a lot of time with the crop at all. Like really, it's like we barely even look at it and then go harvest it. <laughs> like, yeah. Just make sure it's doing okay, you know. That's it. Whereas like you know we plant these out in September and we get to be with that same planting for. It's just nerve wracking when you're getting it started. You really don't want to mess it up, but you get to be with it for like five months and you know you get to. We hand cut all our spinach and you get to like kind of. Uh, dial it in like make you know make every plant like really nice and yeah um it's just a different vibe and you have you have more time to to harvest and yeah stuff like that you get to be in a nice warm (laughs) tunnel tunnel on a sunny day like in the middle of winter it could be whipping wind around and snow and you get to be in a nice little womb of <laughs> metal and plastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, and then, you, you know, like, I feel like the, 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 in the demand in the winter, it's always, it's yeah, continues. It's always so high. And I feel like t- competition is so much lower. And just, it just, things are kind yeah. of, I personally feel like things flow a little easier because, you know, the more pull, the more demand. Yeah. I will say that's actually like um, another way that I've gotten some new business is. You know, October, November, all the regular farmers are uh, kicking their feet up for the winter, hustling their winter jobs <laughs> or whatever it is they're doing. 
and and then you know all the all their customers start calling me yeah and just uh, you know and that's actually been a big motivation for me to try to grow and scale more and buy more um season extension infrastructure uh it's just because it's there's just a huge opportunity there yeah um because i've been actually saying no because i i, I want to carry my regular customers <laughs> the winter and there's only so much you can produce obviously you're like you're you're uh yearning for every like drop of sunlight you can get in the in the middle of winter so that you can <laughs> actually grow things you know yeah um and then along that same line, I mentioned earlier that, you know, you did quick, quick turn crops, but in the winter you're sitting on them. What are kind of the pests that you've seen that you're dealing with, you know, the long season crops? Um, or are you, are you not seeing t- too much? Well, no, with the overwintered stuff, you know, it's cold enough. Yeah. It doesn't. <sighs> Do you have any aphids? Any aphids, aphids in the, yeah. Like what? Le- we usually try to carry like lettuce until at least thanksgiving and that gets tricky with aphids yeah um again try not to like over fertilize and keep it down and then try to like on a sunny day try to trap a lot of heat you know because you're not gonna like that yeah um you just try to do any little trick you can um you know spray it with uh soapy water yeah that's pretty much our technique <laughs> do you use are you in the summer are you using row cover or air box? yeah so in the summer we we deal with the big one is flea beetle because we grow so many brassicas you okay know, we grow a lot of arugula and and then uh lots of like mizuna and stuff like that for our greens mix and so just we just insect net like we plant it and insect net at the i mean sometimes i'll let it like germinate when they just start popping then i'll cover it yeah um depends how it's fitting into like our work schedule for the week sometimes it's like it's planted we got to cover it like right away um but yeah insect netting on on everything yeah on, on all the Brassicas. All brassicas. And then are you doing, are you doing, uh, for irrigation, are you overheaded? Are you drip? How are you, how are you managing that? <clears throat> yeah, because we were such a, a high turnover farm. Like all, all our beds were are getting planted at least three times, if not like four or five. Um, so it's overhead irrigation for sure. And it's all automated. The best thing I ever did is learning how to, you know, wire up some solenoids to a timer. Uh, and you know, running like z- zones out to e- each plot, so it's just a matter of like turning zones on and off, making adjustments for the weather. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Whereas you know, when I first started, I was like dragging hoses around <laughs> <Yeah>. for <laughs> probably like ten hours a week or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i just a time about to what you're saying earlier about like trying to automate those things get those systems aren't controls so that you can keep your labor as tight as possible and i don't know, make make a living like we're all trying to do here yeah um yeah you don't want to be like hand watering if you, if you don't have to yeah yeah exactly anything you can, and really the the, the cost to the systems are expensive but the cost compared to the labor is so much so much yeah. less i mean plastic tubing but <laughs> here's a tip like don't even buy garden hoses just buy poly tubing it's cheaper and then and you can make it as long as you want you and you know just run a line to like every field block which that's like what we do just one to every one and then a solenoid on the other end connected to a timer you just you know then you're then it's there and yeah. you don't even have to, you know, you, you got to put it away in the fall and put it back up in the spring, but that's it. Like we, I mean, even just leave the lines out. We just pull our sprinkler heads out. Yeah. That's it. hundred percent. I like that. It's, that's super nice. Yeah. It is, yeah especially as like I said, if you're trying to scale without accruing too much extra labor or too much, you know, if you're trying to like work on those hundred dollar an hour jobs, right. You don't want to be out there dragging hoses from the house all the way out yeah. to 200, 200 to the, to the, to the tunnels, like that yep. kind of stuff. Just, yeah. It's silly. It gets, it gets real old, real, <laughs> yeah. it gets real, real fast. Um, so, uh, you mentioned earlier that you just moved this property a little while ago. You're building the tunnels, um, so I'm assuming you're building your wash patch set up right now. What's kind of the process? What, what are you building right now as far as your uh, wash patch infrastructure? Uh, we just built 
we just framed out our cooler and wired it. Uh, it's going to be, let's see, 12 by 16 cooler, uh, which should be a good size for us to, to grow into. Uh, and then we're building out like a 30 by 30 wash pack space, which nice. will be just massive compared to anything that we've had before. Um, but that way we'll be able to like magnify our, our production. Um, so we're, we're retrofitting an old pole barn. So it does have a concrete slab in half of it and that's the space we'll be putting our wash back in but we are going to we want to put like floor drains in so we're cutting it cutting into the floor it's a little tricky it's 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 almost like more ideal if you have the money to like pour a whole new pad um we're not gonna do that so we're just cutting out like strips where we're gonna put in our drains and then we're, we're putting in kind of just like a lot of floor drains like around the whole like perimeter and a line through the middle just so that water has somewhere to go yeah uh, and then we'll, we're will we gonna shoot it all out of the building after that um yeah that's the big wash pack uh 30 by 30 that's pretty large yeah and we we contemplated making it smaller uh just to make it cheaper to like heat in the winter time and um the big thing for me is like climate control in the space because we're washing so many greens and we're we're drying them on a screen um after we spin them in a spinner you know um but it, you know on a cool humid day you know like in the fall when it's october it's like 50 degrees and raining and spinach takes forever to dry you're just like standing there waiting <laughs> around and i got like you know i might have three or four people on the clock in there with me yeah. and it's just like agonizing <laughs> <laughs> we're just waiting for things to dry so we can package them um so yeah climate control is a big big deal so we're you know we're gonna insulate the space really well get a proper heater in there and then even get have it so that we can run like a dehumidifier or you know or in the summer if it's really hot like run some air conditioning um just really be able to control the space so that we can predict the workflow yes totally. and not run into those kinds of uh roadblocks that happen you mentioned like there's nothing worse than having a whole crew of people show up to do hard work for you and then you're like well sorry we're watching spinach dry right now that's a yeah we're just hanging out <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard pile enough to be yes <laughs> it's, it's fine <laughs> i like that that's really funny <laughs> yeah it seems like having all the space to be able to spread out a lot like you know just not being like building for like expansion building for the possibility of like oh well we want to have room to work around not be all jammed up on top of each other yeah yeah it's a a nice pleasant place to work is so valuable. And especially if you're going to your own operation, having those conditioned spaces just comes so much more valuable. Especially going from the heat of the summer all the way to the cold of the winter. It, and especially if you don't be doing this, I don't know, let's say, let's say the rest of your life or, you know, this is your yeah. goal. You want the things to be comfortable. You don't want to be hands freezing, you know. Oh, yeah. Hating those little jobs and tasks you have to do. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot to ask from people that are working for you too, you know. Like I – I'm the first to – check in and just be like you know is this too cold or do we got to do something here i don't want to you know i'll put up with a lot but yeah, yeah. you know i don't want to do that to other people no i t it's funny uh, last uh, two years ago i had a uh, a young person come work with me first day it was like 95 degrees pure humidity yeah and i felt like a i felt horrible i went to the store <laughs> got my ice cream sandwich some gatorade you yeah. know like like you know people who suffer <laughs> like i'll do it all to myself i don't care you yeah. know I'll, I'll destroy my own body but i don't want to hurt somebody else who's you know who, who's working for me yeah it's been fun to think of stuff like that like you know i started buying jugs of water and you know, invested in some good like Bluetooth speakers so that we can always have music in the fields if we want it and um, whatever, a microwave, a coffee maker, yeah. like just getting all the things to just to make it nice for people to that work for you to just so that they're not just 
thirsty <laughs> can't do anything about it or something like that so yeah <laughs> baseline not thirsty <laughs> we're taking care yeah, of that very important <laughs> they're not, <laughs> yeah they're they're okay and that's funny from people i've talked to uh from the podcast I hear the same thing over and over again it's like working hard to to build up systems to like uh they take care of their workers. It's also to build a good community, you know, at their at their at their workplace. Um, and a lot of start with just like base necessities. Um, on t- yeah, yeah, you know, just being able to yeah, get a glass of water and keep your meal when you need to is just base things that you know, easy to forget and easy to yeah, pass over. stuff that you don't think about when it's you know when you're just working by yourself and yeah, and then all of a sudden you. <laughs> you have people working with you and you're like, oh, yeah, I should probably help you out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you also under the tree, and you, you know, in the mud, you stay on it. I don't care one bit. But like, oh, well, people don't want to do that. <laughs> no one wants to come and do that after they've been working in the field. They want to have something that's baseline decent. Yeah. Um, so maybe they kind of goes on that same line. Uh, what are some of your long-term, not only like, uh, growth uh like, uh, farm growth, but like uh, financial growth. W- what do you see as like your goal for the next, let's say, five years yeah. for the business? Yeah. So the next uh, <laughs> this year, we are basically trying to just get back to where we were because last year was a moving year. We actually even like paused production for a whole month in July so that we could take all these tunnels down and wow. and move them. Um, we had a bit. We had a pretty slim crew last year. Um, so we had to kind of make those choices, um, to just make sure that we got it done and got out of there in in time, um, get, and got them put back up. So we're just trying to get back to where we were. Um, we were at about 160,000 in sales, um, basically 2020, 2021. Um, and and that, that was really good. That got me to the point where I was making the money that I wanted to make. I could pull like 60 out of the farm and, and be good and feel like I had my needs met and, you know, was able to start like getting caught up with some of the debt that I've taken on uh, over the years to, to grow the farm. Um, so really started to stabilize. The problem is that that it was only working for me. So the next phase and my next, like my goals over the next few, few years is to make it so that it's a working farm for everyone that is going to work here. Uh, at least on a full-time basis. Yeah. I mean, part-time is, I guess, part-time. Yeah. You yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, just trying to, to really, uh, to, to scale our systems and production to a point, um, where we can offer $60,000 to, you know, even if it's just two more people, yeah, then we have a good solid base here. Everyone's happy. Everyone's making a living. Everyone's committed. I'm not having to like look for new employees every year and retrain and all that stuff. And we've, I've been really lucky. I've had a lot of really great people come and work for me and and it's just a bummer you can't keep them yeah. you know uh, they're just you know paying them even like 15 16 dollars an hour it's like it's hard for people to stay at that yeah. um <clears throat> so you know and then also offer them more opportunity to to create more value yeah. and you know to to improve themselves and then be, be rewarded for it you know that's i'm excited about all that stuff yeah. i'm excited to 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 have the opportunity to to do that and to and it, it in in a way it's just professionalizing the the farm it's just making it so that it can be a a profession for not just the owner yeah um so yeah that's what it's kind of what we're shooting for. That's a good goal. And, we, you know, so we're going to, we'll try to double sales and then we'll try to triple. And that's sort of going to max out, um, I guess, our current infrastructure that we're we're building in. You know, okay. Like the well and the, the six, seven acre field that we're developing, the wash pack. Um, if, if we triple, once we triple, 
we'll kind of max it out. And then we do have like a 20 acre field <laughs> behind us if we wanted to like, whatever, expand into other crops or, you know, put up another acre of tunnels or something like that. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe I'll just get some cows. Or yeah. <laughs> but it's nice is that if you have like a foundation, let's say a three person team, people who are making a living, it, 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 it alleviates some level of pressure from you a little bit to have just like a team of people who are all yeah. like, this is my career. I'm coming here to work on this. And you can be like, okay, now I can hand yeah. off more things and you can focus on yeah. what you do best. Absolutely. And, you know, and even, even now, I mean, with uh, the couple employees I have, it's like I'm, I'm trying to pay them as, as much as I possibly can um, so that they just feel empowered to own this. Yeah. And and they know what my vision is and they, they know that, like, we get this place running and going and then, yeah, it can evolve into that. Yeah. So it gives people something to, look, like, work on, look forward to, keeps them motivated. And it's probably fantastic that they have uh, someone to work for who has a vision of inclusion and trying to grow a business or, you know, a community with them, yeah. not just seeing them as like, okay, well, you're just here for a few years and you'll just watch spinach and get out. You know, it's like, no, no, these people, I want, them, yeah. I want you to be here with me foundationally on some level. Yeah. Yeah. And that, not to say that, like, you know, it's nice to have people come in and train them and, um, you know, if they want to just come in and dip in and get some experience, like, I think that's cool too. Um but I do want to be able to offer the uh, the other side so that it could become a long term thing. Yeah, that's fantastic, and we want to have you here for a long t- long time, keep growing. So it's simply the kind of essential to have that those core those core people on on board for that. Yeah. Um. So last two questions, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, second to last, uh, kind of open platform. Uh, kind of what's on your farmer heart? What's something that's been weighing on you that you, you want to talk about? They want to share with people. So it's kind of an open platform for anything, you know, ag related. Uh, you know, yeah. What, what's, is there anything, is there anything that you need to think of? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is a, a more general concern, but definitely very connected to, uh, you know, food production and distribution which is just energy in general and like what is our energy future going to look like Uh, and then also how that correlates to you know the economy because energy like gdp and energy are basically 99 percent correlative so in order to grow the gdp we're trying to we are locked in to consuming more energy um and we are basically, you know, I, I, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone to, to say is we're, we're, we're going to, we're, we're using up all our energy. <laughs> yeah. We've been like blessed with this amazing supply of oil, um, which is, I mean, blessed, yeah, cursed sure. maybe, but you know, it's, it's, it's fueled all this, this growth that we, we have and all these comforts that we have and um you know just looking ahead to the future 10 20 years from now it's like how expensive is that going to get how accessible is it going to be and then how is that going to change to bring back to farming how is that going to change how we like grow and distribute food um especially as i'm setting up this new farm that is trying to be uh you know i'm trying to think 5 10 20 years Mm -hmm down the road and um you know it's like maybe i don't want to scale too much into heavy machinery um which would you know in the short term probably help and be really profitable but potentially in the long term could be maybe not even accessible um you know might not be able to run a diesel tractor or something for uh economically yeah um, so, you know, not, not to be like alarmist or anything, but no. it's like, we're running out of energy, you know? <laughs> but, but no, we think that it's a major input. It, it's, it, it's major input that we, we all use yeah. and how's that going to affect us if that, if that raw input triples in price or, you know. In, in- yeah. And it's so foundational and like, we just don't even know. It's hard for us to imagine not being there. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying to just think of 
what could that be like? What should we be thinking of now? What should we do now while energy is cheap? Yeah. Um, that could help set us up a little bit better for the, the future. And, um, yeah. yeah. Kind of establishing infrastructure and systems that are going to hopefully age well into a possibility where these this input isn't as yeah and and yeah really trying to play both sides it's like on on one hand it's like yeah i can you know we can right now i can i can burn relatively cheap gasoline to to make my deliveries and but yeah what's the like you know i should be focused on my local markets and stuff like that because like what if it comes down to a point where we're doing this on a bicycle or yeah. we're doing it i don't know or just it, it's extremely expensive and we can't drive 100 miles yeah. um in a, in a day or something like that we, we need to i don't know you just yeah. got to play play every hand and 100 percent. and and especially just an ag there's so much the whole game is you know it's the whole game is upset right it's, it's constantly new throwing your face it's weather economics whatever it be that disrupts that that business and we have to be looking that 20 30 40 long-term game because that's the only way you'll we'll, we'll be in the game you know, yeah like that that far ahead yeah um, it's funny. I was, I saw uh, an article. They're talking. It was talking. They were. Uh, it was. It was. A, it was a trade workers. They were saying, "Man, uh, I think. I think it was um like a a roofing company, and they were talking about how they were shifting their business model from the we were, we were originally driving you know twice mile distance hitting clients that far because it was a higher end clientele they were working with. Like, we was it? Oh, we're going to dial that back in and just work within this certain small radius because during COVID when when fuel prices uh, skyrocketed, um, so. Yeah, it, 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 we really t- 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 take for granted be able to pull up and fill, you know, get that three dollar fifty gallon gas. How yeah, much, how, much, how much? How much does that drive the growth of our business? Being able to pull in and rely on that three fifty. Yeah, uh, it's. Uh, I actually can't even remember where I read this, but I, some it was like somebody else saying this, but that the definition of agriculture was turning energy into food for humans. Yeah, I like that. That's a good, and it's like, like yeah, what's the energy, you know? And then, yeah. Um, you know, because human, at a human scale, like growing potatoes or something, like you can, you can put out, I don't know, a few thousand calories and in return get like 10x that back. Yeah. Um, you know, just by the sweat of your brow. <laughs> <laughs> but what we're doing, at, at, you know, even at our small scale, it's like even just running a BCS or something to, or a tiller or tractor to move compost. Um, we're leveraging uh, what would otherwise be a huge amount of human labor. Yeah. And, you know, suppose the economy, if energy goes down, the economy is going to degrow as well. And then maybe there's a lot of people around, so it's like as long as your systems can switch to being human scaled, maybe yeah. you're okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It's, it's having it's having a it's having a whole uh, toolkit at any time that you can pull out and and use when when necessary. And having those things in your back pocket is always yeah. having those thoughts is always so valuable. Uh, thinking, you know, what are the what are the threats not only to my community but to my business and yeah. in, in, in that long term. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. That was that's. <laughs> now, now I'm going to home. I'm going to watch my meter turn. Like, okay, how can I turn that down a little bit? How can I spend a little more? Yeah, resource? yeah. It's a it's a funny thing because it's like you don't want it to stop you now, but at the same time you got to think about it. And I don't, you know, every time I bring it up, like people are surprised or they're just like, yeah, yeah. But it's just like, well, what's what's the solution here? And nobody has any solutions right now. That's the whole thing. But we got to start talking about it. A hundred percent. Man, well, this is a little bit of a little transition from there, but how do you, maybe the last final question of the, of the show, how do you find balance in your life, in your farm, in your family? How do you make that, how do you make that work? Um, it's, it's not easy. Um, I think a big thing is ha- being surrounded by people asking for help, you know, having people around you that, um, can help you like dishing off some of the work to, to people. Um, 
uh, and no, sort of an unsung hero version of that would be my wife, um, just feeding me when I come in at the end of the day and that kind of thing, taking care of the stuff around the edges, um, so that it's not like weighing on me so that I can put a lot of effort out, uh, in the, in the field and then be able to come in and not have to worry about like cooking dinner and stuff like that and be able to focus on my kids yeah. or focus on myself if that's what I feel like I need at the time. Um, and I'm also a big proponent of naps, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, I, too. which I can't nap. Like, you know, when I have a crew here during the week <laughs> and stuff, I, I keep telling them like, if anybody, if you guys really want to get into napping together, <laughs> <laughs> we can build this in. <laughs> no, well, okay. No, just... But, uh, <laughs> You know, on the weekend or whatever, I try to at least catch one good nap on a Saturday or something like that. And I think that really helps me quite a bit and charge my batteries. And it's, it's, it's kind of like my me time. Yeah. You know, and then I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's also good just to take a step back sometimes while you're working, while you're out there and just appreciate all the plus sides of that. You know, you get to be outside and, with plants and around animals around nature listen to the birds you know just try to like step back every once in a while and tune into that yeah the stuff that we're as farmers totally privileged to experience every day but when you get bogged down by the work you find you forget <laughs> about it yeah yeah <laughs> like i remember actually the one of the farmers i i interned for telling me that he I was remarking on like the smell of the tomatoes, you know, like just covered in tomato smell. And, and he just made some comment about like not even smelling it anymore. And I was just like, Oh man, like that's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so pleasurable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just try not to try to be conscientious about that. And Taking time to like enjoy this running around you smell, take, smell the roses or whatever smell the tomatoes well i i appreciate the time i did talk to me uh, about garden for it has been a, a great conversation and so uh, appreciative to be being your home and just be on your farm i really appreciate it yeah thanks alex it's uh it's an honor oh thank you a huge thanks again to Lindsay for taking time out of his busy schedule to sit down and chat with me about Garden Fort. It's been so inspiring to watch his farm grow from a mixed veg business to now a direct-to-retail year-round greens farm that's just thriving. If you want to learn more about them, check out their Instagram. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Hey, you all, Farmer Chassis here, just jumping in real quick to catch you up on some of what we have going on. First, Hannah and I are hosting a couple small farm tours here at Rough Draft Farmstead, like coming up real soon, one on April 25th, 2023, and the other on May 9th, 2023. The details are at roughdraftfarmstead.com or at the notillgrowers.com forum. There will be demos and an educational farm tour. We'll talk about living pathways. We'll dive into some of our other growing systems. Uh, you can ask whatever questions you have and also see the tools and all the different things. We will put a link to that tour uh, in the show notes. Also, we asked you a few weeks ago to do a survey, and honestly, you absolutely slayed it. The response was overwhelming and amazing. But we do have one more request. We have a much smaller uh, survey that kind of pays compliment to the first one, and we would love for you to complete that. It's about no-till growers specifically and how we can improve our content. Link to that in our show notes as well. Oh, uh, the No-Till Growers YouTube channel, I should mention that. Uh, that thing is back up and jamming again for another season of videos. There are new guides for onion, tomato, pepper, and spinach production. There is a video demystifying the grafting process and another video that attempts to simplify compost making. We were also invited by Google to beta test their new software that helps add Spanish and Portuguese dubs to these videos. So our new videos will all have those and slowly our older videos. Uh, go over to YouTube and search for No-Till Growers and subscribe. 
If you loved this podcast episode and would like to support our work, you can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or one of the No-Till Growers hats, uh, which are back in stock. We've got merch there as well at notillgrowers.com. The proceeds from those sales go to supporting our work, which is free and open to the public. If it has benefited you and you have the means to pitch in, that would be super rad. Or even better, become a yearly or monthly patron at patreon.com slash no-till growers, where not only may you get discounts on our stuff, but at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Closter Farm and Livestock Co., Sean at All About the Garden, Bill Altman, Ian at Grindstone Farms, Stephen Smith and Ojai Roots. Huge shout out to everyone who supports our show in whatever way that you can. The Patreon page is the lifeblood of our work, and we hope you will hop on board. And that's it for me. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you next week. Bye.